Hello, I'm Marcus De Silva and welcome to this special edition of the Steps to Investing podcast in partnership with Columbia Threadneedle. Today's episode is about investing for children. So you might be a parent or a grandparent and thinking about wanting to build a nest egg for them given the tough financial challenges that they're likely to have down the line. Fortunately, I've got two experts with me today who also happen to be parents. We have Charlene Young. She is the pensions and saving expert at investing platform AJ Bell. She also happens to be a chartered financial planner. And we've got Faith Archer, who's a freelance personal finance journalist and blogger. Guys, welcome. Hello. Hi. Okay, let's start with some background. Faith, do you want to just explain, you know, your children are 14 and 16, I think you said. When they came along, what were you thinking in terms of these financial challenges that they would face kind of down the line? Well, I think when I had my first child, um, then you're still looking at parenthood, you know, the ideal parenthood, rose tinted glasses. Um, but I was very concerned about the financial challenges um, my child would face in later life. Specifically, I was so aware of the levels of university debt. Um, if they become a student, I think that's topping out like 40, 45,000 pounds, which wasn't the kind of thing my generation typically, uh, you didn't build up anywhere near that level of debt. And also how house prices have soared. So I was really worried about my kids ever getting a foot on the housing ladder. Shailene, you have two kids as well. I think you said four and six years old. Did yeah. you worry about their financial futures? Well, as uh, Faith mentioned, the rose tinted glasses, I think when my eldest was born, um, we were very much looking at the fact we had double income, we hadn't had children yet. And at that point, with hindsight, mortgage costs, housing costs were a lot lower. So I don't think it was immediately concerning for me. Um, perhaps that's also because um, when I graduated from university, it was straight into the financial crisis. So I'd had a bit of a reality check myself. And perhaps I should have been a bit more worried. When my second came along, um, that was just before lockdown. So I think I certainly felt a lot more unsettled then, although personally I was in a fortunate position um, being on maternity leave and um, not having to go on furlough or, you know, I didn't lose my job or anything. But um, yeah, I think certainly unsettled at the time um, that they came along. And are you seeing any evidence at the investing platform, Major Bell, where you work, that people are starting to think about this a lot more, that, that they're thinking about building an nest egg? Yeah, absolutely. So going back to, to the pandemic, we saw a doubling in the amount that people were saving into junior ISAs with us. Now, that did also coincide with the allowance um, being uplifted. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to that in a bit. But we obviously found, um, which was common across investment platforms, some people had a lot more time. Some people had spare cash. Of course, there was a swathe of people that did not. And we saw um, people taking advantage of that by looking at junior accounts, so particularly, I think, the time aspect for some people having time to actually get round to something that was on their to-do list. We're all guilty of kind of having a, a long list and not getting round to it all. Mm. Um, and certainly it was backed up by HMRC's own statistics. Now, there, there's quite a long time lag on some of these, but we saw in the 2021-22 tax year, um, 1.2 million junior ISA accounts had some money paid into them. Um, and that was an uplift of 25% on the previous year. So we sort of saw it at AJ Bell and it looks like it was playing out in the wider economy as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's get on to how we go about cracking this. Um, Charlene, I want to start with you just first. Financial goals. Mm -hmm. Is it important to set some financial goals when it comes to investing for your, for your children? I believe so. Yeah, I'm a big fan of financial goals coming from a financial planning background. Um, but I think if you're doing it yourself as well, it's just a really good way of seeing how you're going to get from A to B, particularly when you're thinking about investing for children. That could be quite a long time frame if you're really thinking about it when they're born or when they're very young. Um, you know, you've potentially got sort of your 18 years or e even further if you're if you're looking at other types of accounts. So I always think financial goals help people kind of visualize where they're going, visualize the journey and keep on track. And also you might be able to work backwards to think about how much you should put away to get towards that goal if you've got a price tag on it or, or how much you can afford to. Mm, OK. Faith, did you set some financial goal? I think I didn't set a specific kind of pound amount on it. Um, but very much thinking about the time frame because I'm aware how much that influences the choice of what you invest in and what kind of account you use. If, um, you know, there's certain kinds of accounts where your money's going to be locked up for 18 years, 
that's no good if your financial goal is to try and help fund school trips and school uniform. Equally, if you are really thinking far ahead, um, maybe even your child's retirement, that money, if you lock it up on a pension, is not going to help fund a wedding, a first home, a first car. Mm, okay, right. Okay. So this is we're, we're going to get on to this, but this is the types of investments that are appropriate for different time frames when you're sort of thinking about your financial goals. With yours, you were very much thinking about university fees, was it? And it was basi- basically thinking about the 18 plus stuff. You know, when they're on the cusp of adult life, they're leaving home. Would they need support in some way, year out, university, first home, you know, whatever combination of things they do. But that was the point I was pinpointing. Okay, okay. So we've kind of got some financial goals. Then I suppose the next thing is kind of, well, well, how much can I afford? You know, you've got this money kind of coming into your household. How do you decide what the right amount of money is to put away? I think for us... One of the first things was almost the concept, if you're in an aeroplane that's going down, you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first. You know, however much you want to save for your child, you need to make sure that you've looked after your own finances, that you can afford your your bills, the rising mortgage costs, childcare, you know, all that kind of thing, emergency savings. Mm. In practice for us, when we had our first child, you know, we'd come similar situation, dual income, not had kids before, and we decided to allocate the child benefit. Um, and kind of invest that at the time. I think it was about 75 quid a month for one child. So that was money that we hadn't had before. And we thought, okay, let's stash that cash. Now that changed by the time my second one came along because I had chosen not to go back to work, not to go back to full-time office work. I was just doing a bit of part-time. And by the time my poor second child came along, although we could put in a bit of money to get it started, we actually needed the child benefit by that point for general living costs. Okay. Are there any rules of thumb from a kind of financial planning point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Echo what Faye said about the oxygen mask, fit fit your own first, whether it's your goals. And that I think also ties over to what you mentioned in terms of an emergency fund. So um, make sure you've got that pot of money that you need to call on. Um, Should something go wrong with your house, car, your job, all of that. And then if you're thinking about putting cash away, um, for the long term. Again, it's it's kind of thinking about what that long term is. So a good rule of thumb is anything sort of less than five years that you might want to get your hands on. Um, you've, you've got to kind of be thinking about leaving it out in cash, really. Um, investing is for the long term and it will help you if you've got that longer term hi- uh, time horizon to kind of outlive the bumps in the journey. Okay, interesting. So you've kind of got, I suppose, two routes. I suppose we're moving into that. You can save your money or you can invest it. And you mentioned about that five-year time frame um, when it comes to stock market investing so is that how you kind of think about which route might be appropriate yeah again if it comes down to the saving versus investing question for me it is all about time horizons Um, and you know you've got inflation to think about we all are far more familiar than we'd like to be with inflation I think these days but that is the single biggest thing that is going to eat into the the power of your wealth or power what you're saving or investing over time so if we are talking about longer term savings for for children. Um, Investing is, you know, it's been shown by various studies to be the kind of best way to try and beat inflation over time. So for me, yeah, inflation is that kind of key key one that you're you're trying to plan to to grow in excess of. Okay. And the key risks, I suppose, with investing, though, is it can be volatile and the values of things can swing around, which is why those longer time frames are quite important when when you're thinking about doing something like that. Yes. What would you say, Faith, to anyone who is maybe a bit nervous of stock market investing? Well, I was certainly nervous of stock market investing when I started saving for my first child. The I hadn't done any investing in my own right, apart from stashing money in the company pension, and I didn't have to choose where that went because it was an employer's scheme. I think what gave me more confidence, because I was thinking of that 18-year time horizon, and I was aware that the Bartleby's Capital Equity Guild study showed that the longer you can invest, the more chance you had of um, investing, of the stock market beating cash. And so longer time horizons, I think investing as long as uh, 10 years, you know, 90% chance of um, investments meeting cash. And it went up to 99% if you're investing as long as 18 years. So I think that was one of the things that, like, long term time frame, I've really got to bite the bullet and go for investing rather than just sticking the money in a second account and seeing the value eaten away by inflation. 
Okay, well, let's get on to the investments themselves. I think the kind of exciting bit. And Ajabel has got thousands of products. Investment platforms tend to have thousands of products, which can create a bit of analysis paralysis. So I just thought we'd try and break that down a little bit simply. Um, you, there are two major asset classes shares and bonds, I think it's probably fair to say. There are some others as well. Uh, how would you think about the difference between shares and bonds? Yeah, so um, starting with shares, that's an opportunity to own a little bit of a company. So it could be a big brand that you've heard of, um, and you are buying into that company in the hope that the value might go up. It could, of course, also go down, and in the hope that you might also earn some income in the form of dividends, depending on how that company's performed. Now, that's the crucial part there. You are at the mercy of the fortunes of an individual company if you're buying individual company shares there. So they really sort of do sit at the kind of top end of the risk scale, if you like. Um, you mentioned bonds as well, and that is another way of investing and getting access um, to investments. So you can... Um, invest in bonds that are issued by governments and also bonds issued by individual companies. So government bonds or corporate bonds. And bonds are effectively a loan to that company or that government. So you know at outset the the length of time you're loaning that money for, the term, and you will know the level of interest on offer in exchange for that loan. It's sometimes called a coupon. Again, they probably sit um, lower down on the risk scale than individual shares, but you still are a uh, you know, subject to the fortunes of that company if something did go, or the government, if something did go um, particularly wrong. Okay. And these are individual assets, as you mentioned. So generally, there are other products that are more diversified that can reduce risks a little bit further than individual assets. So that's another way of looking at this. And these other types of products are called pooled investments. That's one way of, of, of sort of diversifying your risks. Do you want to explain what these are? Yeah, so a great example of pooled investments would be an investment fund. And um, you are then pooling your money together with other investors into effectively a shopping basket of different investments. So funds could concentrate just on shares, and that could be shares across the world, or that could be shares just in the UK, or funds could um, invest in different types of bonds, or you can get multi-asset funds, which are a blend of those two different asset classes um, and others. And they're really great, a great way of spreading risk and being able to get access to investing without having to research individual stocks or individual bonds yourself. Okay, so if you're investing in a fund, and let's say it had... 50 or 60 different company shares in it, then if something goes wrong with one of them, you've hopefully got you know, a, a whole load more that will buffer those issues in that individual company. So that's how they kind of diversify out some of your risks while still exposing yes. you to the market and, and the potential returns that can come from investing in those kind of assets. There's another way, there's another, and then you can sort of break down pooled investments a bit further into active products like funds and investment trusts and passive products like ETFs and trackers. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, so starting with trackers, as you've mentioned, or passive investments, um, again, that's a, a shopping basket or a, a fund where it's designed to track the performance of a particular index or benchmark. So, um, for instance, going to the UK, you might have a, a tracker that's tracking the FTSE 100, so the 100 leading shares in the UK. So rather than you having to try and buy one of every 100 of those shares, that fund um, aims to replicate the index. Um, so... However, the index or the area that you're looking to track performs, you should hopefully see that passive fund kind of move in line with that up or down. In terms of um, active management, that's where there is an investment manager and a, a research team behind um, uh, the investment manager looking at perhaps a particular area or specialised sector um, with the aim of picking kind of the winners and trying to outperform a particular benchmark or index. Now, that doesn't always go to plan. They might outperform the index one year, but they might underperform as well. So um, there is that that added risk there. Um, you're not just going to see your investment move in line with the benchmark necessarily. And of course, if you're paying for that kind of specialist investment research, that comes at a cost. So the main difference really that you'll see is that passive funds will tend to be um, cheaper than their actively managed counterparts. Faith, let's get on to what you felt comfortable in investing in then. 
I certainly didn't feel comfortable investing in individual stocks and shares. You know, I thought that my chances of investing in a company like Apple right at the beginning were much smaller than investing in something like, say, Debenhams that has disappeared from the high street. So I was much more comfortable going with pooled funds where that spread my money. Um, I think I was also keen to spread it as widely as possible, looking globally rather than, say, just at the UK, and aware that over 18 years I could take a bit more risk. So I could go for, say, you know, emerging markets or global smaller companies where you, you take more risk in the hope of higher returns. Now, in practice, the time I was investing, um, 2007, 2009, it was junior ISIS were actually child trust funds. There were a limited range you could choose from. And the tracker funds, the index funds, it was quite a hefty price tag attached. I think the fees were pegged around 1.5%, which is high for a tracker fund. Mm. Um, and some of the few actively managed funds that I could go for were investment trusts. Um, so a kind of pooled fund that's actually quoted on the stock market itself. And one of the reasons I liked those was, for example, well, main investment I chose with the F, Foreign and Colonial um, F&C Investment Trust. It's been around for well over 100 years. You know, it's survived wars and depressions and it's still there. It's still <laughs> delivering returns. So that gave me a greater sense of comfort. Okay, so you wanted that kind of global diversification when you were thinking about your investment. Yeah, I didn't believe that the UK was necessarily going to be the best performing part of the global economy for the next 18 years. Faith, I mean, you've mentioned an investment trust there. How do these products differ slightly from regular funds? Well, typically, when you look at pooled funds, um, unit trusts tend to be more prevalent, but you also have investment trusts. And the difference with investment trusts is they're actually companies in their own right. They're co quoted on the stock market. One of the things that quite appeals to me is their, their stock price can differ from the assets that it owns, the assets it invests in. So if it's trading at what's called a discount, um, it means that when you add up the cost of all the shares, it's actually less than the assets. So I feel like I'm getting a bit of a bargain um, if, I, if I'm buying at a discount. But one of the things that I really like about investment trusts as individually quoted companies is they're allowed to borrow to invest. So it's a bit like taking out a mortgage to buy a house. If house prices subsequently go out, go up, you really profit from that. And similarly with investment trusts, historically over the very long term, on average, they do tend to outperform unit trusts. And I think it's partly because they can borrow. It's known as gearing. Um, that also means, of course, if you borrow the money and make a really bad decision, it increases the risk and increases the losses. Investment trusts also have an independent board acting on behalf of the shareholders. And if you're buying the shares, you're the shareholder. They're acting on your behalf. And they have the ability to hold back returns in the good years to pay out in the bad years. So it means that the dividends they pay out can be more consistent. And what if you're the sort of investor who uh, looks at a fund and is worried that they may be investing in companies you actually don't like, maybe tobacco or companies like that. Are there ways around that? You can definitely put your money where your principles lie. There's the socially responsible investing, ethical investing, funds with different flavours of green, whether they have environmental objectives or they are you're investing in the kind of employers that take their social responsibilities um, very strongly. The one thing I would say is it's definitely worth looking under the bonnet because your definition of green might not match the fund's definition of green. So, for example, some funds might invest in um, oil, the oil companies that are doing a lot towards solar panel, solar power, but you might not be comfortable um, investing in any fossil fuel producers at all. So you can absolutely find greener investments, but do check out what you're getting. OK, let's get on to actually opening the account. We've, you know, we've got some goals. We've decided on, on potentially some products. We've got to put them in something. Uh, so we're thinking about investing for our children. Can I just open a share dealing account and start doing it? Well, you could open a share dealing account in your own name, um, but that will be in your own name and it will be subject to tax. So that's the big kind of sticking point with that. So um, the income that you get on any investments and any investment profits could be subject to income and capital gains tax. Okay, so that's if it's just a regular account. Could I then use my own ISA to start investing for my children? Yeah, this, this comes up quite often, actually. And I think it comes down to control. So your own ISA would be in your own name. You'd be choosing, obviously, the investments. Um, and you could potentially access it if you wanted to. However, anything that you save in your own ISA for your child will be using your own ISA allowance. So if you're in the position where you might be wanting to save uh, more than your 
um, own ISO allowance for the year, you'd be sort of eating to, into that with what you save for the child. Right, okay. So, And that's £20,000 a year that you're it allowed is, yeah. per, per adult. Okay, so then we get on to, there are actually quite specific accounts for children. You've got the junior ISA and a junior pension, the junior SIP. Do you want to explain how you might think about the trade-off between those two? Yeah, so the junior ISA is a special type of tax-efficient savings account for under-18s. Um, and it has its own savings allowance. Um, so per child, you could put away up to £9,000 a year, which is quite a generous allowance each tax year. And as I say, that's in addition to your own £20,000 for your own ISA. They must be opened by the parent or the guardian of the child. So that sometimes trips people up because um, grandparents quite like the idea, of course, of saving tax efficiently for, for their grandchildren, but they must be opened and managed by a parent. But once they're open, anyone can actually pay into that. But the one thing to bear in mind is that any money that's paid into that junior ISA is a gift to the child. You can't change your mind and then access the money. Um, so with investment junior ISAs, um, that money is uh, locked away until the child is 18. Um, you mentioned junior SIPs as well, yet there are flavours of pensions for under 18s um, and they have an allowance um, of £3,600 um, a year. So with the magic of pension tax relief, that actually costs whoever's putting money into that pension £2,880 a year and you get the basic rate tax relief. Now, we talked about access and waiting to age 18 for junior ISAs. With SIPs, it's even longer. So at the moment, the earliest age someone can access a SIP is 55. That's going up to 57 in 2028. But by the time the, the, the newborns of today are coming to retire, it's likely to be a lot higher. So really, junior SIPs, you know, they would really harness the power of compound investing. Um, but that's not going to be helping your child when they're leaving college, perhaps looking at university. Um, they are not going to be able to access that money for a very, very long time. OK, Faith, you mentioned, I think it wasn't junior ISAs back when you opened them. It was child trust funds, did you say? Yeah, it was, but I've transferred but the money since. OK, yeah. so they're now into junior ISAs. I suppose the big question, we kind of briefly touched upon it now, is around access. So... Are you not worrying that come their 18th birthday, it could just be blown on the Magaluf trip of a lifetime? Uh, I think that is, <laughs> it's obviously a concern. And uh, it, I would hope <laughs> that uh, um, I've talked to my children about what the money is for. And the idea, it might be a significant, you know, a reasonably significant sum that's to help them with something like university, a deposit on a house, rather than just blowing the lot on clothes and parties. So it is something that I've talked to them about over time. But it also means that even if I could have afforded it, I'm not sure I would have funded junior ISAs to 9K a year, year in, year out. And, you know, I quite like the idea that we also, you know, as a couple, my husband and I have separate investments in ISAs so that we could therefore choose to do all that money. Currently, I think my kids, I think my oldest one, there's about £16,000 um, for the 16-year-old and about £12,000 um, for the 14-year-old, partly due to market movements, the <laughs> essential unfairness of the market. Um, and I, so I think that will be a meaningful sum that hopefully they can take seriously. I suppose it is actually because you know you've got this nest egg that you're building, there's nothing you can do about them having access at 18. It kind of forces you into teaching a bit of financial education, doesn't it? It can be quite a good reason for, for teaching them a little bit about their finances. Yeah, certainly. And I'm a big fan of talking to children about money in an age appropriate way. And so I have, you know, talked to them about the fact there is this thing called the stock market, that money spread in different companies all around the world. You know, it's grown way more than we put in. I think, you know, it's certainly from oldest, it's about four times what we've paid in um, and introduce them to the idea that there is a world beyond savings accounts. So let's just get on to our final sort of topic, which is around, you know, practically about, OK, I then want to start, you know, putting some money into it. Um, is it is it best, Faith, do you reckon, to just save up a chunk and then put it into the market? Or can you chip away at it? Is, is, is that a better route? Personally, I've always... The good thing about investing is you don't need an enormous amount of money. Um, you can, with some of the robo advisor websites, you can even invest from as little as a pound. Um, if you want to choose perhaps more interesting investments, then certainly regular savings plans start from about twenty five pounds a month. It's not enormous sums. Um, and the good thing about setting it up 
as a standing order is then it just slips out of your account month after month. You're not having to remember to do it. You probably won't miss the money so much. Um, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, as I have 16 years down the line and suddenly going, wow, it's really mounted up with market growth and compounding. And you just don't need to worry about timing the market as well. That's another thing that people look at the stock markets and there are times when it looks really bad and other times when it's really flying. Drip, drip, drip just means that you're getting it all the way along, really, and you're, you're not yeah. worrying about that market time. When If you're putting the same amount in each month, you're buying more when prices are low, you're buying less when prices are high. But it does mean that you're not second-guessing yourself and trying to time the market. You know, the old adage is not timing the market, but time in the market. You know, keep it going for as long as possible. Okay, and finally, Charlene, I just wanted to touch on financial advice, because we can go away and do this ourselves and select funds and open accounts, but we can also pay for financial advice and get someone basically to do this for us. When do you think it's appropriate? So I think the, the most appropriate time might be where we're talking about um, lump sums that are to be invested. So that could be from a child inheriting some money, or if you've got a slightly more complicated family situation, um, so for me, financial advice helps people really keep on track with those goals over the long term um, and kind of help you avoid some costly mistakes. So particularly in the areas of sort of tax planning, um, there are implications of investing money for children um, that's come from a parent rather than a grandparent. Um, there's a little known tax rule where if the money earns over £100 a year, it actually ends up being taxed on the parents if that money has come from parents. Now, if you put that money into a junior ISA, that doesn't apply um, but people might be nervous about the access implications that we've talked about. So if you think there's lump sums coming down the line or there's some wider sort of succession or inheritance tax planning that you want to take advantage of um, with your family situation, it's definitely worth speaking to a financial planner or a tax advisor. Well, on that note, I hope all you parents and potentially grandparents found that very useful. A big thanks to Charlene Young and Faith Archer and to our sponsors, Columbia Threadneedle. If you've got any questions, please leave them in the comments box below. If you're watching this on YouTube or else you can email me, Marcus, at stepstoinvesting.com. Until next time, goodbye. Remember, when investing, your capital is at risk and you may not get back the original amount that you put in.